the fight to make things right. What GM plans to do for the families of victims of faulty ignition switches. Confirmed. Who will now head up the U.S. Health and Human Services Department? And what are the implications for the HHS mandate? The president stands by his decision to swap Taliban prisoners for a captive army sergeant, but why not rescue other Americans? Then we talk with one of the church's youngest priests before he begins his first assignment. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, June 5th, 2014. Good evening from Washington, D.C. Thank you for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick. We begin looking at news now. A new Secretary of Health and Human Services will be sworn in soon after today's quick Senate confirmation hearing. Sylvia Matthews Burwell will replace Kathleen Sebelius. She'll lead the agency that includes Medicaid, Medicare, and the FDA. Wyatt Goolsby is on Capitol Hill tonight. And Wyatt, this confirmation process seemed to go very smoothly. Yeah, Brian, Sylvia Burwell got a clear majority of the votes today. Lawmakers are hoping that some new leadership will help turn things around when it comes to Obamacare. Mismanagement, website problems, uh, partisan division are just a few things you think of when you think about this first year of Obamacare. So there's no doubt that better implementation of the health care law is something that's going to continue to be a pressing issue. The department's work to ensure accessible, affordable, quality health care through the implementation of the Affordable Care Act is making a difference in the lives of our families and our communities while strengthening the economy. In the last month, Sylvia Burwell has been facing tough questions and comments from senators. The position for which she is currently nominated is perhaps the most thankless. That's why I advised her against taking the leadership position at HHS. After all, who would recommend their friend take over as captain of the Titanic after it hit the iceberg? Obviously, she ignored my advice and accepted the nomination anyway, continuing her pattern of public service. Burwell was named by President Obama in November. His choice to replace Kathleen Sebelius, who resigned in April after presiding over the disastrous rollout of the health care law's website. Burwell, a 48-year-old West Virginia native, serves as the White House budget chief. She has received bipartisan support, with a few senators holding out as a form of protest of Obamacare. Burwell has told Congress that despite criticisms of the health care law, she says ultimately it's helping expand coverage and keep costs down. Positions she will likely continue to defend moving forward. Will you in fact be the Health and Human Services Secretary for the American people or will you be as your predecessor has been the ambassador of Obamacare? Senator, in my, in my current role at OMB, and if I am confirmed in this other role, uh, it is my objective, and as I've talked about in my opening statement, I'm here to serve the American people. One new challenge for Burwell today, a new government document has surfaced that shows essentially two million people who signed up for Obamacare either um, had an error or discrepancies in their applications, which means that their rights to benefits could be lost. So at this point, Brian, more possible red tape for this administration this summer. Wyatt, are there any, any implications for the HHS contraception mandate? Brian, not likely much is going to change when it comes to the president administra administration's position on this particular topic. Burwell, Burwell has been particularly vague when it comes to answering specific questions about this topic. The only thing that she said that is related would be that she's going to work with consumers to make sure that they better get all the information that their coverage includes, which again is pretty vague. But at this point, we can tell you, Brian, that she's been pretty in step when it comes to whatever the president's position has right. been. Wyatt Goolsby at the Capitol tonight. Speaking of the mandate, a victory for the Catholic Benefits Association based in Oklahoma City. That group is run by Oklahoma City Archbishop Paul Coakley. It includes more than 400 Catholic businesses and ministries. A federal court in Oklahoma has ruled that it's exempt from the contraception mandate, and that means employer members of the association do not have to pay the fines for noncompliance. Earlier this year, Archbishop Coakley told us it would be a sad day for the nation if the court ruled against them. Meanwhile, the Archdiocese of Philadelphia has also filed a suit against the mandate. A spokesman for that archdiocese says the rule forces employers to violate their religious convictions. Charitable organizations affiliated with the archdiocese are also joining in the suit. 
Here to help us break down the different legal challenges to the HHS mandate is William Saunders from Americans United for Life and Alliance Defending Freedom's Matt Bowman. Matt, in the case of Oklahoma, that seems to be a victory. Is that going to affect any of these other cases? It's an important case for two reasons, I think. First of all, it's a combination of nonprofit Catholic organizations and organizations that are doing business for profit. And what that demonstrates, I think, is that Americans don't abandon their freedom either when they try to earn a living in business or when they serve the community. The religious freedom of the church belongs to Christians whenever they're trying to follow Christian teaching, and, and it belongs to all the members of the church. Secondly, this adds to the number of injunctions that have been obtained. Of 71 different court rulings, 63 of them have led to courts to protect religious freedom against this mandate by the administration. And William, Kathleen Sebelius, a self-proclaimed Catholic, was a warrior for this HHS mandate. Will the new secretary make any difference in this issue? We can hope for the best, but I think we've got to prepare for the worst. I don't expect her to make any difference, the new secretary, because the secretary is there to implement the policies of the President of the United States. This mandate reflects uh, what his administration thinks about the conscience rights of Americans, which is they don't think much of them. So, Matt, the Supreme Court should be ruling on this or some of the cases that are before it soon. It will. Uh, in just a matter of three weeks, the U.S. Supreme Court will issue a ruling on the case of Hobby Lobby and of Conestoga Wood Specialties, which Alliance Defending Freedom represents. And the issue in that case is whether families even can exercise religious freedom just because they want to earn a living in business or whether the Obama administration can cripple them with fines because they don't want to provide abortion pills. And William, how do you feel that that's going to go? It, it's imp almost impossible to predict with our Supreme Court, but I, the, our cause is just. I think the law is really on our side. I think we will hopefully win, but it could be a narrow victory. It, it might not eliminate the need for continuing lawsuits. William Saunders and Matt Bowman, thanks for joining us tonight. Some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. A major announcement from General Motors today. The company launched an internal investigation in light of 13 deaths linked to faulty ignition switches. Today, GM made the results of that investigation public. CEO Mary Barra says 15 employees have been fired, many of them executives. GM will also launch a compensation fund, but we don't know how much money is involved. People who have been injured, as well as the families of those who have died, can begin filing claims August the 1st. The GM CEO hopes it will help with the healing process. I realize there are no words of mine that can ease their grief or their pain. But as I lead through this crisis, I want everyone to know I am guided by two clear principles. First, we will do the right thing for those who were harmed. And second, we'll accept responsibility for our mistakes and commit to doing everything within our power to make sure this never happens again. In addition to the employees who were fired, the auto giant has disciplined other General Motors employees. President Obama has accepted the withdrawal of his choice to be the top health official at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Jeffrey Morosky pulled out, hoping to avoid a prolonged political battle in the Senate. He was nominated last month to be VA's Undersecretary for Health Care, replacing Robert Putzel, who designed or resigned under pressure. The firestorm over long patient waits at VA hospitals and clinics later claimed the top man at the VA, Eric Shinseki. Well, world leaders are meeting right now in Brussels for the G7 summit. The main focus of the conference is that situation in Ukraine. President Obama and British Prime Minister David Cameron are giving Russia one month to get its act together in dealing with Ukraine or face further sanctions. From the outset of this crisis, the G7 nations have stood united, clear in our support for the Ukrainian people and their right to choose their own future, and firm in our message to President Putin that Russia's actions are completely unacceptable and totally at odds with the values of this group of democracies. That is why Russia no longer has a seat at the table here with us. Prime Minister Cameron was referring to the fact that Russia is no longer part of what used to be the G8. Well, there's a massive manhunt underway right now for a suspected cop killer in Canada. Justin Bork is wanted in connection with the deaths of three Canadian Mounties. It's happening in the Canadian province of New Brunswick. Authorities have spotted Baroque three times today, but he managed to escape. Police say they don't know what motivated the suspect. This is the deadliest attack on the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in a decade. 
We're now seeing new video of the Sudanese woman sentenced to death for not renouncing her Christian faith. This just released video shows Miriam Ibrahim sitting together with her newborn girl and 18 month old son. Both her young children are living with her in jail right now. She converted from Islam and married a Christian man in 2011. She is sentenced to death for apostasy, but is appealing the sentence and demanding to be released. A local charitable organization offered Ibrahim a few gifts, including a blanket for her children. We have more information now on the swap of Taliban prisoners for American soldier Bo Bergdahl. Congressional leaders now say the administration was worried about threats from the Taliban to kill Bergdahl if the deal went public. Apparently, those safety concerns also were the reason for the quick timing of the exchange. Of course, the administration has been under fire for deciding on that exchange unilaterally. There are also questions tonight about why the administration singled out this particular soldier from Idaho for a prisoner trade. Many Americans are imprisoned overseas, including another Idaho man, a minister jailed for his Christian faith. Our Jason Calvi has that story tonight. Jason? This American minister hasn't played with his kids or seen his wife for nearly two years. Saeed Abedini is locked up in Iran. But now we've seen just how far the United States is willing to go to free an American. Consider the case of Sergeant Bo Bergdahl, exchanged for five Taliban fighters. I got to watch the video of him actually being handed over, and mm -hmm. I thought it was very emotional to watch that and to imagine Saeed returning home one day. What you see here is you see the president's priorities, and when he wants to free an American uh, overseas, he takes every step that he can to do that. President Obama mentioned the pastor at the National Prayer Breakfast back in February. And as we continue to work for his freedom today, again, we call on the Iranian government to release Pastor Abedini. Iran police arrested Saeed when he was setting up an orphanage. A court convicted him of being a threat to Iran's national security. The charges related to his leadership of Christian communities there. Abedini serving eight years in a dangerous prison. Pastor Saeed had been severely beaten during his time in prison. He had received internal injuries, and due to those injuries, he needed medical care. So he spent months in a hospital, but on May 20th, he was slammed back into prison. And back in Idaho, it's another day without dad and husband. It's a pain that you live with every single day of your life. You wake up and it's there. Uh, that person's missing. The U.S. doesn't have formal diplomatic relations with Iran, so the State Department says they frequently talk to their go-between on this issue. That's the neutral Swiss government. But so far, Brian, no progress has been made on this issue. Is there anything any of us can do about this, Jason? Of course, Brian, prayer always is a, the most powerful thing, but there's also urging the White House, urging the State Department to do something. There's actually an online petition right now. It's gathered 285,000 signatures. It's found on the Be Heard Project's website. All right, Jason, and let's pray for this pastor as well as all Americans held captive. Coming up, the time to act is now. U.S. bishops urging Congress to reform immigration laws. And a prince of the church is given a regal send-off to eternal life. On this Thursday, thanks for joining us here on EWTN News Nightly. I'm Brian Patrick. American bishops are leading a renewed push for immigration reform. They say the time to act is now. This latest call comes ahead of the bishops' conference meeting next week in New Orleans. USCCB President Archbishop Joseph Kurtz says he and his brother bishops will pray and work with Congress to get new legislation passed. Kevin Appleby, the director of the Office of Migration for the USCCB, is joining us now. And Archbishop Kurtz is using some pretty tough words here. What is this message that he's trying to get through to Congress, and why do the bishops are why are they taking such a strong stand? Well, the bishops have been working on this issue for a long time, and they see every day in their social service programs and their parishes that families are being separated. We've got a record rate of deportations in this country, and they see that human beings are suffering and that the system needs to be changed. They think it's an unjust system because people come here, they work, we take their work, we take their taxes, but we don't offer them protection, and that it's time to do it. And on the Hill, they've been waiting for a year now to do it, and now's the time. What are some of the specific reforms the bishops would like to see? Well, foremost, we need to bring people out of the shadows, and, and it's been characterized in different ways. Some would call it amnesty, others would call it 
an earned path to citizenship, but you need to bring people out of the shadows so they can be part of the system, they can pay taxes, they can, you know, be protected under the law, but they also can fully contribute to our society. Um, many of them have been here for years. Um, bringing them out of the shadows is, it protects them, but it also is in the, in the national interest because they're able to fully contribute to the, the economy and be part of our culture. But there would be people who argue, even many Catholics, that they came here illegally, they don't belong here, send them back. How do you address that? Good. It's a good question. Um, we have to say, first of all, why did they come? They came to get jobs. Uh, they're filling jobs, important jobs in our economy, in certain sectors, in agriculture, in service. And they're helping our economy. And what the bishops are saying is, if they're contributing, if they're net contributors to our country, and they've established equities in this country, we might as well bring them out of the shadows, make them pay a penalty, make them get in the back of the line, make them pay a fine, make them learn English, make them do things to get right with the law, and then integrate them into our society and we become a stronger country. And at the same time, we're doing it in a humanitarian way. Yeah, we have to remember they are our brothers and sisters. This is true. And many of us came from immigrants originally. Right. So. Uh, what do you expect? Do you, does, is Congress, is there any indication that Congress is going to listen to this call? Well, if you follow the politics of it, the Senate has already acted on a bill and the House of Representatives has been waiting for about a year to do it. We see a, a window of opportunity this summer where the House of Representatives could act on this in a day if they wanted to. It's just mustering the political will. So we're asking Catholics and Archbishop Kurtz is asking Catholics to pray and to contact their representatives and say, now's the time to do this. Let's get it done. It's in the best interest of our nation. All right, Kevin Appleby with the USCCB. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Well, it is a split that still hurts after centuries, the break between the Orthodox and Roman Catholics. But today there is progress towards reconciliation. Our Rome correspondent, Alan Holdren, joins us now with more. How are you? Pope Francis, meet Adam I. The Orthodox Church of Armenia has two leaders, both with the title of Catholicos. Adam is one, the other was in the Vatican just weeks ago. The high point of today's visit, a shared prayer for unity in the Pope's private chapel. Amen. Those images from just inside the Apostolic Palace right here behind me, Catholics and Orthodox joined together in worship, brings back memories of the Pope's trip to the Holy Land less than two weeks ago. There at the site where Christ rose from the dead, another Armenian Orthodox leader was right beside Pope Francis united in prayer and ever closer in faith. We respect a lot the Catholic Church, not because uh, it's, it's a big church, it's a powerful church, but because it's one of the traditional churches, like the Armenian Church. And then we respect more the system, the discipline that they have in the church. Uh, that's why we look forward to uh, have close ties with the uh, with Vatican. For the two churches, split for centuries, those ties appear to be on the mend. In Rome, Alan Holdren, EWTN News Nightly. All right, thank you, Alan. Also in the Vatican, Pope Francis helped to say goodbye to a prince of the church. Cardinal Simon Ludusami died this week. His funeral was today, and he was born in India in 1924. He became a cardinal in 1985 and served the Congregation for the Oriental Churches for several years. Looking ahead to next week, Pope Francis has called the cardinals together for a special meeting on Thursday. One of the goals for the cardinals will be to set a date for the canonization of six new saints. Four of the blesseds are from Italy and two are from India. It's ordination season. The men who spent years preparing for priesthood are getting ready for their first assignments. Our Mark Irons visits with one of them tonight. Jimmy Sue doesn't claim to be the tallest guy you'll ever meet. I'm 5'4", uh, <laughs> very small. But at 25 years old, he can claim to be one of the youngest priests in the United States. I was looking over the pictures from my first mass, and I could see one where I'm coming down the aisle in the beginning for the opening procession. And I see in the background there's this guy just looking at me, and he was looking down, and there's a, whoa, he's young. Recently ordained a Paulus priest, Father Jimmy celebrated his first Mass at St. Paul the Apostle Church in New York. When I started picking up the host and saying the words of institution, this is my body, this is my blood, I, I just kind of realized, wow, I'm actually doing this. That God had just used me. 
to make present himself in the bread and the wine. And then sharing that with others. I thought that was the moment that really hit me because not only am I just saying the words now, I'm actually sharing it with others. He's still trying to fit in to his new vocation and get comfortable with the title. To be honest, I'm still getting used to the being called a father. Six years ago, Father Jimmy started his formation here at St. Paul's College in Washington, D.C. And now he's packing up. There's still a lot of last minute things to do. Um, there's a lot of errands that I still have to run. Uh, it's almost hectic right now. Today, he flies from D.C. And in a few weeks, we'll begin his first assignment across the country at this Los Angeles parish. Here you can see a picture of the outside. Father Jimmy admits there will be plenty of challenges moving forward, but he sees his age as a blessing. Yeah, I'm young, but that also gives me a lot of opportunities. Sure, people might have perceptions, but that's part of what, what I can do is show them that it's not about age, that it's about Jesus, that it's about our faith. It doesn't take somebody who is 50, 60, 70 year old to have an understanding of the faith. And as he looks ahead to the start of this new adventure in faith, Father Jimmy has a message for all those watching. I actually have not heard my first confession yet. Uh, I'm, still, um, I'm still waiting. I'm, the confession is open. <laughs> Mark Irons, EWTN News Nightly. All right, thank you, Mark. Father Jimmy and all of our new priests, you are in our prayers. Well, it's a different kind of march on Washington. The Priestly Fraternity of St. Peter is hosting a pilgrimage going from Maryland to Washington, D.C. This group started today. The pilgrimage culminates with a traditional Latin Mass on Saturday at the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception here in D.C. Up next, Little League Baseball turns 75. We meet one of the players from the very first Little League game. And we profile a Native American who served his country in a most unique way. This is EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, June the 5th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick. 75 years after its founding, the only thing little about the Little League Baseball is the young players. Today, Little League is a global enterprise with 2.4 million players in more than 80 countries. The signature event, the Little League World Series, played each August in central Pennsylvania. It's gone through plenty of change since 1939, allowing girls to play in the 70s and more recently, limiting pitch counts to protect young arms. Dig, dig, dig. But its basic dig, dig. appeal has remained as constant as the 60-foot base paths. What we hope is that if the kids have fun playing, uh, they're under you know, principled uh, adult leadership, that what they'll take from that experience will pay dividends and benefits to them for the rest of their lives. Something four generations of the Hauser family have learned firsthand. Dick Hauser played in the very first season in 1939, a game he'll always remember, although it was not a very memorable game for him personally. My first game, I played shortstop. And uh, I didn't make an error, but I didn't get a hit either. <laughs> Dick's great-grandson Owen is only five, but he's already been bitten by the baseball bug. Little League Baseball, now 75 years young. And the New York Rangers hockey team looking to tie up the Stanley Cup series after a loss last night. It was a close game, but the L.A. Kings won 3-2 in the opener. Game number two at Staples Center in Los Angeles. And if L.A. wins the Cup this year, it would be the second time in three years. So we end tonight with a farewell to a man who used his unique talents to serve his country in a very special way. Chester Nez, the last of the original Code Talkers, has died of kidney failure. His knowledge of the Navajo language helped the U.S. military keep messages secret during World War II. The program met pop culture with the 2002 movie Code Talkers. He was 93, the last of the Code Talkers. They were very significant in the Allied victory in World War II. Of course, tomorrow is the anniversary of D-Day. We'll have a special show for you on that. In the meantime, be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. You can catch us again anytime on EWTN's YouTube page. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, I'm Brian Patrick. Thank you so much for watching tonight. Good night and God bless you.